Welcome to our lecture tonight. Thank you for joining us. Today is Tuesday, July 26, 2022. I'm Steve Shields, president of Royal Asiatic Society Korea. RAS Korea expresses sincere thanks to our generous patron, Asia Development Foundation for their continued support. We also appreciate all of our many other donors and, and members too who donate big or small. Your support is very welcome indeed. Uh, RAS Korea reminds you that lecture content does not necessarily reflect the opinion or positions of Royal Asiatic Society Korea. Tonight, we're joined by uh, Dr. Professor Henry Im. Uh, Henry is an associate professor of Korean history at the uh, Yonsei University's Underwood International College. Uh, he was born in Seoul, grew up in Chicago, uh, received his BA, MA, and PhD from University of Chicago. Uh, and then he, he taught at UCLA, at University of Michigan, at NYU, and began teaching at Yonsei in 2013. Uh, his uh, recent publications include North Korea as Neighbor, Critical Scholarship on North Korea in the Korea Journal, just last fall. Uh, Christianity, the Cold War, and the Construction of the Republic of Korea, again in Korea Journal a, a year before. And his book, The Great Enterprise, Sovereignty and Historiography in Modern Korea, was published by Duke University Press in 2013. <clears throat> Professor Im will be talking to us tonight about the Korean War, public memory, and post-Cold War perspectives. As always, after the lecture, we'll have some time for Q&A. So please welcome Professor Ann. Oh, thank you very much. I, I think I'm not logged into Zoom yet. OK. Hey, wait. Joining the meeting. Okay. <clears throat> password. 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 It's cool. Got it. You got it. Okay. Bear with me, please. Sorry. <clears throat> Takes a little while. Uh, yeah, there we go. It's all good. <clears throat> it's all good. Cool. Let's see how that I can. It lets us stop sharing our screen so that Henry can share his, his. If you just did the mm -hmm. Uh, oh, I have enjoyed it. Sorry. Join her. Please, please give us some help here. So we should have done that. <clears throat> Sorry. No, that's all right. Got it. Should I join with video? Join with video? Yes. I should mute. I <laughs> mute your, yeah. And start video. Okay. Cool. And then if you go down to screen share, you should be able to show it. Yeah. Cancel bar, so this should come up. Uh, good evening. I'd like to begin by thanking Reverend Stephen Shields, President of Royal Asiatic Society Korea, and Ms. Uh, Ms. Joanne Hong, the program uh, coordinator. 
it's a pleasure for me to give this lecture tonight. It's a pleasure to meet you and, and me. Um, in Korea and across Northeast Asia, the irresolution of the Korean War is I'm talking about the irresolution of the Korean War. I think that's uh, apparent uh, everywhere, if you look carefully. Um, both in a formal sense, because uh, there is no peace treaty. There, uh, Jacko has just sent a message that they can't hear. Can you get closer to a microphone? The, the mic's right in the camera. We don't have PA in the room, but online, that mic is the... That mic. Next thing's up if, uh, if I turn on my mic. We could mute this mic and yeah, we could mute this, this mic. Yeah. Okay. But but I'm not. No, no, if, if can we, you hear me now? No. If if we mute this mic, the people on Zoom can't hear anything. The people on Zoom, can you hear me now? Yes. Wave a hand. Okay. Um, I'll just continue. Would that be alright? So I was talking about the irresolution of the Korean War. And both in a formal sense, because there is no peace treaty, the war is not formally ending. But also in terms of obviously tension, hostility, uh, the Korean War is very much um, not ending. And in fact, um, official narratives about the Korean War guard their publics against dissonant memories dangerous scholarship. As official narratives about the Korean War are continually repeated, they define the horizon of what constitutes loyal citizenship. I apologize, someone asked if you can switch to the larger screen, so it's easy to make. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand. It was just quick. Oh, I see. Okay. No, it's okay. This helped me actually to sort of navigate the PPT, but okay. Cool. One second, please. Oh. Um. You know what? Just bear with me, please. Yeah, bear with me. Because um, I need to switch between the, my lecture notes and the PPT. And so, sorry about that. What's really important is what I say. <laughs> That's just the support. All right. In South Korea, especially among the older generation, and certainly in the American public memory, Korean War is mostly recalled as an instance of American and UN rescue, rescue that saved South Korea from North Korea and eventually enabled its South Korea's economic ascent. In North Korea, the United States is seen as an imperialist power that replaced the Japanese empire and as the instigator of the Korean War. In this situation of unending hostility, to arrive at a compelling and critical understanding of the origins and the character of the Korean War actually requires considerable intellectual, political, and emotional investment. At certain points in my talk, it may seem as if I might be taking you beyond the horizon of loyal citizenship in South Korea and the United States, but I hope you will find that worthwhile. Let's uh, begin with a critical look at public memorials. Specifically, this photo is the Statue of, Lip uh, Statue of Brothers in Seoul. Um, and the next memorial we'll look at 
is the Korean War Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Um, after that, we'll consider some key aspects of the Cold War and post-Cold War narratives about the Korean War. In doing so, um, I hope you get a sense for how liberation from Japanese colonial rule and national partition came in the same moment in 1945, how two Koreas came to be officially created and how the Korean War began as a civil war at least two years before June 25, 1950. This um, Statue of Brothers, it's, <clears throat> I think, a very interesting and uh, revealing monument. It was installed in 1994 in the out outdoor exhibit area of the War Museum in Seoul, in Yongsan. I'm sure many of you have seen it. The Statue of Brothers embodies what seems at first sight to be a yearning, embodiment, um, a desire for reconciliation. But I think if we look more closely, what we see actually is, I think, what we might call a logic of murderous love. The statue depicts a dramatic encounter during the Korean War on the mountains that traverse North Chungcheong and North Gyeongsang provinces. <laughs> Two brothers fighting on opposite sides had come face to face. The older brother is a Park Kyu Chal, a lieutenant in the South Korean army. And the younger brother, Park Yong Chal, was a soldier in the Korean People's Army the North Korean army. The two brothers stand on a dome with a jagged crack running up its center. Uh, to, um, the crack narrows toward where the two embrace. And there, the dome becomes whole, signifying the healing of Korea's national division. Because they embrace, the Statue of Brothers is said to symbolize both the tragedy of a fratricidal war and the yearning for reconciliation and reunification of the Korean nation. I think a thoughtful, thoughtful visitor would notice that the older brother, the South Korean Army Lieutenant, <clears throat> stands erect, fully armed, both hugging and holding up his younger brother, who is unarmed and collapsing into his older brother's embrace. On closer inspection then, this reunion, brotherly, brotherly love, restoration of the family bond is premised on the younger brother, the former KPA soldier, having been a, abandoned, having abandoned or perhaps been stripped of any and all identification with the North Korean state. Ultimately then, the Statue of the Brothers depicts a Cold War vision, South Korea's fantasy that persists. It's a vision, it's a fantasy of how the Korean War should end with South Korea's victory over the North. This is how the Korean War should end. This is what victory looks like. So this statue <clears throat> actually depicts South Korea's desire, articulated as love for brethren in the North, whom we are led to believe yearned, yearned to be rescued by us. <clears throat> this is the, uh, what about the United States? This is the uh, Korean War Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. It was installed around the same time. So the President of the United States at the time is Bill Clinton and President Kim Young-sam attended the, uh, the opening. 
during the Korean War for the first time in the 20th century, the Amer American fighting units were racially integrated. So of the 19 statues, 12 are white, three black, two Hispanic, one Native American, and one is Asian American. The, the 19 statues <clears throat> are enclosed in a triangle that reaches into a circular pool called a pool of remembrance. Some of the soldiers are signal, uh, doing hand gestures, signaling with their hands. They look tired, but alert. A theme of alertness is reinforced by the inscription on the wall that extends to the pool of remembrance. Freedom is not free. The dedication stone, all the way at the front, here. This is the text of the dedication stone. <clears throat> Claims both innocence and willing sacrifice. Our nation honors her sons and daughters who answered the call to defend the country they never knew and a people they never met. It's probably true that most of the American troops who fought in the Korean War had not known where Korea was, perhaps uh, never met a Korean person in their life. But there's no question, certainly, that American leaders had known where Korea was. In August 1945, as Japan surrendered to the United States, it was the United States and Japan surrendered only to the United States. It was the United States and that uh, proposed to the Soviet Union that Korea be divided along the 38th parallel. The United States and the Soviet Union were of course allies during World War II and they had agreed on a trusteeship arrange arrangement for Korea. But the details had not been worked out. Um, trusteeship was an American proposal. In early August, 1945, Russian troops had fought their way into Korea as liberators. American troops were far away. Uh, they're in Okinawa, nearest troops are in Okinawa. It would be the second week of September that the first US troops would arrive. In this situation, and just as Japan is surrendering to the United States, Washington proposed to Moscow a divided occupation with a line drawn across the 38th parallel. In Washington, D.C., the State War Navy Coordinating Committee had given uh, two young colonels 30 minutes to, to decide where to divide Korea. After consulting a small map, Colonel Steen Rusk and Charles Bornsteel recommended the 38th parallel because it would roughly divide Korea in half uh, and would include the capital of Korea in the American zone. This is uh, Gregory Henderson. He was uh, an official in the US embassy in Korea uh, before the Korean War. Later, he's a, a scholar at Harvard. Voicing regret, explaining the anger that Korea felt, Henderson would later say, of all the countries we divided, Korea was the most innocent, the least deserving of being divided. We never intended in a planning way permanently to divide Korea. We intended to have a united Korea. The mistake was that we didn't lay the proper grounds to occupy Korea jointly with the Soviet Union. The Korean, text, Korean textbook, the textbooks in Korea, <clears throat> um, the trusteeship issue, issue is one of the most misrepresented issues in the Korean uh, history textbooks. You go, you go directly from the idea that trusteeship is responsible for um, creating two Koreas for division. 
trusteeship did not need to mean um, divided occupation. It could have been a joint occupation. Soviet and, and American troops in Seoul, Soviet American troops in Pyongyang, etc. Um, and Henderson is pointing out that there could have been a joint occupation. How did the United States military government govern Southern Korea from 1945 to 1948? So this is before the Korean War. The United States had established a military government and an American military government directly governed Southern Korea. This is the very first message communicated to the Korean people by the US Armed Forces. 300,000 leaflets were dropped over Southern Korea from American bombers between September 1 and September 5. One side printed in English, the other side printed in Japanese. To the people of Korea, um, I just have a few quotes here. <clears throat> I'll read the first sentence. The armed forces of the United States will soon arrive in Korea for the purpose of receiving the surrender of the Japanese, enforcing the terms of surrender, and ensuring the orderly administration and rehabilitation of the country. So we're coming, and we're coming for, with, for three reasons. These missions will be carried out with a firm hand, but with a hand that will be guided by a nation whose long heritage of democracy has fostered a kindly feeling for peace for people's less fortunate. I'll skip down to what's quoted here. Hasty and ill-advised acts on the part of its residents will only result in unnecessary loss of life, desolation of your beautiful country, and delay in its rehabilitation. Um, The US occupation, the United States Army military government um, would have a difficult time. <laughs> the United States military government would have a difficult time because of um, the political sentiment, the dominant political sentiment in Korea right after liberation from Japanese colonial rule. What did the Koreans want? These are the results of opinion polls taken in the American zone by the United States Army military government, people like Horace H. Underwood, etc. cetera. The, the, un, Horace Underwood II, he was with the United States Army, he was with the OSS, and then he was with the United States Army military government. In 1946, a public, public opinion poll by the United States military government in 1946 determined that of 8,000 people polled in the American zone, 70% supported mm -hmm. socialism, 10% supported communism, 13% supported capitalism. A year later, uh, the Korean Journalists Association opinion survey found of 2,495 people polled, 70% 70, 70 um, supported the People's Republic. This is different from North Korea. People's committees had emerged throughout Korea right at the time of liberation. And then very hastily, people, these people's committees presumably sent reps, representatives to Seoul. And, they, and the leaders of the People's Republic wanted to declare uh, a government before the Americans landed. Still in 1947, 70% supported the People's Republic. In the same poll, 71% wanted um, the name of Korea to be the People's Republic of Korea. Joseon in Min Wong. I think it would be reasonable to guess that in 1945, Communism and communists were viewed with respect. <laughs> In fact, there was no broad um, 
social support for anti-communism <clears throat> right after liberation at this time it's not nice to be anti-communist <clears throat> so it's only with support from the united states army military government and bolstered by christians and anti-communists who came south that anti-communism became the ruling ideology of the south korean government when it was established in 1948 and it should be noted it took a great deal of violence to establish south korea as an anti-communist state in 1948. <clears throat> this is uh, John Muccio with uh, Sung Man Ri. The photo is actually from mm -hmm. 1950, right after the uh, Korean War began. Um, in the conventional narratives, the conventional narrative that I mentioned right at the beginning of the uh, lecture. What the United States Army military government did and did not do between 1945 and 1948, it's glossed over. But the United States had the central determining role in creating South Korea and creating South Korea as an anti-communist state. This is uh, <clears throat> from an interview uh, in 1971 of John Muccio, who was special representative of the president of the United States to Republic of Korea and then ambassador to South Korea. What were the first problems you, you had to deal with? Well, <clears throat> the government of Korea was inaugurated August 15th, 1948. So exactly three years after liberation. The United States military government and all of its ramifications were still intact. My immediate concern was the transfer of all the functions of military government to the new government set up by the Koreans under the direction of uh, President Sung Man Rhee. We transferred the police force, the whole police establishment on the 11th of September, 1948. Between that and December 12th, 1948, when we finally transferred the bank account to the new authorities, there was a constant tr transfer of responsibility from the United States military government authorities to their new Korean counterparts. It was very intricate. <clears throat> now, let me very briefly introduce the, what we might call Cold War narratives. Uh, and then, um, and then I'll talk about uh, new scholarship that has emerged that we might rec uh, <clears throat> refer to as post Cold War narratives. Um, in South Korea today, the Korean War is usually referred to as Yu Gi Oh Jeonje, the June 25 War. June 25 is when South Korea and the UN's officially sanctioned date of the war's beginning, <laughs> when the North Korean army, the Korean People's Army, began a general attack across the 38th parallel. The Korean War as Yu-Gi-Oh, June 25, portrays South Korea as a victim of communist aggression and the United States and the UN as saviors of South Korea. To the extent that <clears throat> the historical origins of the Korean War are considered, Soviet ambitions are blamed for the division of Korea along the 38th parallel, and of course, the Korean War in 1950. Drawing on George Kennan's so-called so long telegram, said that Soviet policies at the end of World War II had sort of deep political uh, historical roots rooted in the Slavic desire for possession of ice-free ports uh, and this long-held Slavic ambition came to be coupled to 
Kremlin's strategic goal of worldwide communist domination. And so Soviet Union and then Kim Il-sung, um, Kim Il-sung acting as a puppet for of Stalin, launched a premeditated attack against South Korea in 1950. And so President Truman um, referred to the Korean War as the first step in a general communist plan to pass from subversion to armed invasion and war in the general scheme of world conquest. So that's the official, you would say, sort of narrative. A more kind of liberal narrative emerges in the 1960s. And that narrative sometimes you hear also uh, in South Korea of Korea as a victim. Korea as a victim of international uh, rivalry caught between two gigantic whales, right? a shrimp caught between two whales. This view says the initial decision to divide Korea has to be attributed both to the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, because by the 1960s, it becomes clear that it was the United States that had proposed that Korea be divided along the 38th parallel. This view says at the time of liberation from Japanese colonial rule, Korean society had class conflict. You know, like anywhere you have the left and you have the right. But the division of Korea and the Korean War was um, a catastrophe um, that was not of uh, Korea's doing. With the sudden collapse of the Japanese Empire, mm -hmm. occupation of Korea by Soviet American forces, a minority on the extreme left and a minority on the extreme right pushed for the creation of separate states in their opportunistic grab for political power. It was Kim Il-sung that started the Korean War, but he could have done so only with the consent of Stalin. The Korean War was essentially a proxy war and the Korean people became caught up in a maelstrom created by American-Soviet rivalry. <clears throat> Um, I think I'm going to have to skip some parts here. I was going to review some history um, about the concept of trusteeship. This is, uh, you know what, I think I'll talk about trusteeship. So trusteeship, it's really important. It's an American proposal. Trusteeship was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's sort of quintessential uh, sort of tool for how to maintain an alliance with the Soviet Union and how, how to create a single world. <clears throat> I think we can compare uh, this idea of tr this uh, trusteeship with the thinking of, let's say, a Wall Street lawyer or a banker. A Wall Street lawyer or a banker knows you don't need 100% of the stock to control a company. All you need is 51%. And Often, you don't even need 51% to control the company. After World War II, the United States is absolutely the most powerful nation on Earth. Trusteeship, where the United States would, Franklin Delano Roosevelt would put his arms around Stalin and say, let's work together. Let's figure out how to um, help countries like Korea achieve independence, et cetera. Um, beyond national sensibilities, of course, you can't really go beyond national sensibilities, but beyond national sensibilities, conser conservatives like Sung Man Ri had concrete reasons for opposing trusteeship. If the Soviet Union and the United States would together form a joint commission and together form a 
unified provisional government, there would have to be land reform. There would have to be a purge of those who had collaborated with the Japanese, etc. And inevitably, after the Americans leave and the Soviets leave, this provisional government becomes independent and it will become a leftist, leftist government. Thus, see this um, December 1946 New York Times article uh, about Sung Man Rhee. Thus, by December 1946, Sung Man Rhee was calling for the establishment of a separate state in the American zone. Um, that's why, starting in the early 1980s, historians in South Korea like Kang Man Gil. Um, rejected the trope of Korea as victim because by treating the Korean War and everything that leads up to it as something that was determined by conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, the narrative about Korea as victim in effect freed from blame those Koreans who should be held responsible for the creation of two Koreas. And for historians like Kang Man Gil, who taught at Korea University, the leader, the Korean leader most responsible for the creation of two Koreas was Sung Man Rhee. Sung Man Rhee, who became the first president of South Korea. The left, the communists, so they supported trusteeship, which is an American proposal. So you have this irony, Americans, the American military government supports conservatives like Sung Man Rhee, but those conservatives oppose trusteeship. The left, the Korean Communist Party, they support trusteeship, although it's an American proposal. The left didn't like the idea of trusteeship either. It's like Americans and the Russians are gonna create a new Korea. But they knew, I mean, practically speaking, they knew what would happen. If you oppose trusteeship, then what's going to happen? Americans will create a government in the South. The Soviets will create a government in the North. And then two Koreas will be created, which is exactly what happened. The American strategy for creating South Korea <clears throat> and then withdrawing was to turn to the United Nations. A temporary commission was organized. Originally, they were to conduct elections throughout Korea, North and South. But the Soviets would not let them into the North. Historically, the population of Southern Korea is twice the population of Northern Korea, just because of typography. I mean, if you if you go down to Cholla province, you have these vast um, rice paddies. You have nothing like that in the North. South historically supported a much larger population. And the Soviet Union did not trust the UN, saw it as a tool of American foreign policy. So now the temporary commission has the dilemma Should they conduct elections just in the South? The Canadians and the Australians on the temporary commissions were opposed to this. If the UN, if the UN conducts elections just in the South, it would create a government just in the South. And then, and, and then obviously a government would be created in the North by the communists with the likelihood that both governments would claim sovereignty over all of Korea, which is exactly what happened. So until today, South Korea claims sovereignty over all of Korea. North Korea claims sovereignty over all of Korea. Um, 
that statue is in the, the Sasam, April 3rd uh, Peace Memorial uh, in Jeju Island. There was bitter opposition to the elections in 1948. There was an uprising in the island of Jeju. At least 30,000 people are killed uh, in Jeju. Uh, there was a regiment based in uh, Yosu, Suncheon. They were ordered to go to Jeju to uh, put down the rebellion. They refused. They go up into the mountains, join the leftists. And then martial law was declared in that area. Lots of people die there too. We're talking about at, at least 100,000 people in Southern Korea dying in this revolutionary, counter-revolutionary violence before June 25, 1950. Right-wing youth groups like the Northwest Youth Corps and the National Police were sent to the island. Troops are still actually under the operational command of the United States Army military government. All right, a government is established in 1948. What kind of government was it? Um, this is how, again, Gregory Henderson describes um, what it was like. The police were very cruel. They descended where they could. They arrested fre frequently without warrants. The kind of justice that was dispensed relied very little on rules of evidence. It was not very just. People were tortured to produce statements for the prosecutors, et cetera, et cetera. Military. What kind of military was this? It's basically led by Koreans who had been uh, graduates of the Japanese um, Imperial um, Military Academy and who were officers in the Japanese Imperial Army. So Chong Yer Gwan, Kim Da Gyer, Kim So Gwan, Baek Sun Yat, etc. Of course, um, Park Jong Hee also, who was who led the coup in 1961 and was president from 63 to 79. The first 10 chief of army staff in South Korea were graduates of the Imperial Japanese Army Academy. The, the father of the South Korean army is uh, Hausman, James Hausman. Captain James Hausman. I'm going to skip to the beginning of the, the conventional war and talk a little bit about some of the recent, um, recent scholarship that emerged in South Korea from about the 2000s until about middle of 2010. This scholarship, uh, for the most part, looked at um, what this war was like for Koreans and Korean society. And um, generally, the, the scholarship talks about the Korean War as having the character of that it was a war against society. And this kind of scholarship, I would, for the purpose of this um, lecture, I would call post-Cold War scholarship in South Korea. A shared goal of this scholarship is to give an accounting of both state violence, but also intimate violence. Violence done uh, within families, between neighbors. State violence might be like soldiers coming and they don't know who you are, you don't know them, and they might shoot you. Intimate violence, we're talking about neighbors, who've lived next to one another for decades, um, killing one another. 
We should recall that during the Korean War, the number of civilian deaths is estimated to be more than 2 million, a higher number than the total combat casualties of all the armed forces uh, that were involved in the three-year conflict, three-year war. That's to say, civilian deaths on this scale are not just collateral damage. Um, first, just a quick look at um, what, what we mean by something like state violence. And I think here, two laws or two government decrees uh, illustrate what we're talking about. And here, in uh, English language scholarship, I'm drawing on the work of Hanik Wan and others. Um, there's comparison, we can compare a state of emergency, that's the state martial law that was declared in 1948 in that Yosu area I mentioned, and state of emergency that was declared in uh, June 1950, late June 1950, once the Korean War begins. In 1948, in Yosu, amidst this uprising and so forth, um, this state of emergency said, rule that individuals who conceal traitors or those who communicate with the latter shall receive the punishment of death. That is to say, if you, if you give shelter, probably even food, or you, uh, you know, work as a messenger for the leftist partisans, then uh, you can and will be killed, shot. The state of emergency declared in June 1950 was in form an extension of that kind of 1948 law, but there's a, a very big difference. In its character, the June 1950 um, state of emergency was different from the pre-war variety in that it justified preemptive violence which targeted presumed hypothetical collaborators. In other words, 1948 in places like Yosu Sunchan, if I suspect that you gave shelter to leftist partisans or gave food or you're acting as a messenger, I can shoot you, kill you. 1950, if I think that there's a possibility that you would help the enemy, you haven't done anything yet, I will shoot you, put you in a truck, drive you up a mountain, go up the mountain, uh, take some trenches, and then shoot you in the back of the head. About 200,000 people were killed by the South Korean police and army at the outset of the Korean War. And in fact, jump to the conclusion, the vast majority of people killed in the South before and during the Korean War were not killed by communists. They were killed by the South Korean police, the right wing, and the South Korean army. The vast majority. <clears throat> but back to this uh, post-war scholarship. State violence continued throughout the war, changing in character from preventative killing. Right? So I think there's a possibility that you might help the enemy, I, I kill you, to punitive killing. Right? Some South Korean units in this area were ambushed or something. Then other units come in and everyone living in this vicinity will be punished. So 1950, preventative killing and then punitive killing. Um, punitive killing sometimes extended to family mem members or substitute killing, right? So there's information that uh, 
you know, a male member of this family uh, had joined the partisans or something, uh, but that person is not here. So a different member of the family would be uh, killed <clears throat> as a substitute. The violence committed by one side radicalized the intensity and scale of violence committed by the opposite side. And this vicious cycle of terror perpetuated against the civilian population devastated countless local communities. The competing states systematic terror against civilians developed into a sort of a spiral of intimate violence perpetuated within and between communities. So you might have, let's say, one village that was most prim primarily leftist and another village that was primarily rightist or within a village in which the victims of violence then turn into perpetrators of violence and then the per perpetrators become victims. It's a situation that's repeated in, depending on the location, a situation that was repeated many times as the front moves back and forth. That is to say, in the rural areas, this uh, more recent scholarship has shown, the Korean War is remembered as a village war a conflict between different groupings, networks within the village. And in many villages, the extent and pattern of the violence within a local community grew out of very locally specific historical conditions. Depending on what happened during the colonial period and what happened after the after liberation, etc. So this is a, it's a sign it's a little bit outside of Gongju. There you had trucks pull up, uh, political prisoners were loaded onto the trucks, driven up here, and then the prisoners were marched up, had them dig trenches, <coughs> and then shot. <coughs> um, very quickly. so. 1960, uh, April 19th revolution, there's a slight democratic opening. And then during this slight democratic opening, families, bereaved families, families of those who had, uh, been, who had been killed by South Korean police, etc., begin to organize and submit petitions and demand investigations. Park Jung Hee's coup d'etat in 1961. Um, this is certain. I don't think we can argue that it was the primary reason. I think it's one of the reasons. Lots of people in 19, from like late 1960 into 1961 are coming forward, demanding investigation, organizing bereaved families, putting up, for example, these memorials. One of the first things that the Park Chung Hee coup d'etat does in 1961 is to arrest leaders of the bereaved families, put them in jail. In this case, this is, um, where is this? This memorial was um, effaced. The lettering was effaced, broken, broken and then buried. I think in the 1990s, it was uh, dug up again. Um, armistice. Armistice is a ceasefire. It did not lead to a peace treaty. One of the key, one of the, the key uh, aspects, elements of uh, an armistice is that you don't bring in reinforcements, right? An armistice is like a stepping stone toward resolution of a war, toward signing a toward signing a peace treaty. And so, what's crucial is 
you don't take that opportunity to bring in more tanks, uh, bring in more guns. So this 13D Thirteen D of um, the armistice says you can bring in spare parts to repair a tank, but you can't bring in more tanks. It was the United States that unilaterally declared that it would the UN forces would no longer abide by Thirteen D of the armistice in 1958, and then introduced tactical nuclear weapons into South Korea. It had to do with like trying to decrease the budget, you know, et cetera. I'm gonna try to simplify and sort of generalize things. Um, number of things I think we can, we can say, and uh, I would welcome your questions during the Q&A, but South Korea back then, is not obviously not the same as South Korea today. Today, South Korea is a democracy. This democracy was achieved after decades of struggle. Democracy was not something that was given to the Koreans. The Koreans and South Korea achieved their democracy with a great deal of sacrifice. And it's this democracy that provides the condition that makes, that made uh, post-Cold War scholarship possible. And I would say vice versa. Okay, why don't I pause, stop here today? I'm, I'm hoping that maybe you would have lots of questions that I could answer. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna let you feel the questions yourself. I don't in the media. Uh, if people who are online have questions, type them in the chat box and our folks will uh, call attention to those. And uh, I'll just let you and then just go ahead and field your, your questions. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> what impact did the death of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and uh, was it April 1945 uh, have on the idea of the trusteeship? Did that all fall apart after Roosevelt died or? Uh, you know, would have, if Roosevelt had would have lived another ten years, would that have changed history? It's a what if question. Yeah, what if? <laughs> yeah. It's a what if question. Well, well uh, let me rephrase it. Was his death impactful to the dissolution of the trusteeship idea? Sure, I think so. Um, with the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you certainly had the the loss of one of the key central sort of proponent, proponent of this vision of a single world for the United States would sort of you know, try to keep, uh, maintain some sort of relationship with the Soviet Union yeah. and then sort of integrate the entire world politically <clears throat> through the UN, economically through the general, general agreement on tariffs and trade, mm -hmm. uh, knit the entire world together. So with the loss of um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I think the argument has been made that um, people at a sort of a lower level and they're smart people. Mm -hmm. They're smart people, but um, they were at positions where they did not have, they were not, they did not have, they were at positions that did not encourage sort of <clears throat> creative, um, thinking. And so the idea, for example, of like drawing a line, that certainly uh, is not sort of like the kind of thing that FDR, I think, yeah. would have done. Okay, thank you. Um, at what point did, because I think it's a big reason why the free one agency spiral is because of China's support of North Korea. At what point did they start kind of assisting or anything? Was that before the war, like with a long set to the Union? I think it uh, depends on how far you want to go back, and you can make the argument that uh, North Korea assisted China mm -hmm. 
during the colonial period, I saw this somewhere, something like 70% uh, of the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese Northeast, like in Venturia, were Koreans. In um, 1950, there's people have different numbers, uh, mm -hmm. figures, but at least 30,000, perhaps as many as 70,000, maybe even more Koreans were fighting in the People's Liberation Army. Um, and then in 1949, after the victory of the Chinese Communist Revolution, so <clears throat> released us, we want to go liberate uh, Korea. And so they marched back and they joined the Korean People's Army in the North. Um, that probably was one of the factors for why Kim Il-sung launched an attack in 1950. Land reform law had finally passed. Land reform was just starting to actually get underway like in June, 1950, it looked like maybe um, the insurgency was like being put down in, in Southern Korea. There seemed to be a possibility that the Sengmanri government might be able to survive. And you have these revolutionaries who joined, they wanna liberate all of Korea. Um, there were a lot of things that were, I think, coming together uh, in 1950. Do you have an online question? Sure, of course. Can I read it? Sure. Okay. Uh, Jacko, question says, it is my understanding that the leftists in Korea and the rightists were both opposed to the trusteeship by the whites until Moscow declared their support for it. The leftist groups in followed Moscow to move in support of this plan. Yeah, uh, the Green Communist Party had called for a rally in Dongdaemun Undongjang. I think at first it was supposed to be a rally against trusteeship. This touches on sort of nationalist sensibilities, right? The Americans and the Russians are going to create a, a green government. But then, yeah. Uh, the Korean Communist Party changed its line to support trusteeship. Um, is the question about why they changed their line? I did ask a question. Right. This is online. Mm -hmm. uh, you're asking why they changed? No, it's just because you mentioned that the communists supported trusteeship. So Jacko just pointed out that they appoint, they opposed the initial. Right. Uh, initial. I would, uh, I would just, you know, add to that. I, I have studied the southern side of the uh, creation of Korea and the Korean War uh, mm -hmm. by looking at all the archives and the So what they show is the Soviet support for a trusteeship um, in December 1945 when they made the Moscow agreement was um, a tactical matter. Uh, Roosevelt's kind of notion of trusteeship made absolutely no sense uh, to the Soviets. <laughs> that was in a different universe uh, than the universe uh, of the Soviet Union. So, as they're trying to work out something in Korea, they have to come up with something that gives the appearance of continuing to cooperate with the US because they need cooperation with the US in Germany and in various other places that they're still hoping to get uh, economic support from the US, a number of reasons. And so they need to have some way to maintain the appearance of cooperation without uh, losing control of their zone of Korea where they had all been put in place in the code of government by December 45. So 
saying they will support trusteeship in getting the communists in the cell to support it then, which they instructed the communists to do, then enabled them to say when the Joint Commission began to meet, we will only consult with Korean parties that support trusteeship, you know, which would have been only the Communist Party. And so of course the United States would not agree to that. So it was a way to obstruct creation of a unified government while maintaining the appearance of cooperation. Yeah. yeah. And the, the Communist Party in the South went along with it because it couldn't be otherwise. They were depending on the Soviet Union for money, for arms, for everything. And besides, they were loyal communists at that point. Can you give your name, real quick? Catherine Weathers. Um, this is a little more abstract, and I'm not sure how much you can speak on this, but I, from things I've read, you know, there have been like peace eras where like family members separated by the North South Pacific have had a meeting in the middle kind of thing. And I think there's been over the years, you know, a, a desire to recombine North uh, South Korea. But I feel like from since just readings I've done that as especially as we get to a more modern age, North Korea is just so far behind South Korea, you know, technologically, the economic I can think that if for whatever reason they did combine one day that I feel like South Korea's economy would kind of be throttled by trying to uh, catch North Korea up. And so I wonder if you feel that there's almost a sense of maybe a, the younger generation of South Koreans that kind of don't want to recombine because I think it maybe would hurt them so much or what, what do you think? Do you think that it's people want to unify Korea still or is it kind of, are people more complacent with how it is? Right, um, the younger generation, uh, certainly not eager about uh, unification with North Korea. And I think uh, for progressives in South Korea too, it's more toward like um, end of war and let's live as good neighbors. Yes. I'm wondering about the reception of this new narrative. You mentioned many Korean scholars in the recent decades have been suggesting new narrative for the looking for documents to support uh, the idea that South Korea is responsible in a way. So, how is it going to be received within the academic uh, in the circles in Korea and South Korea? Is it a common narrative now? Or is it do people object in Korean academia to this new narrative? The scholars uh, who write the textbooks are like my generation, so about my age. Right? So back in the late 70s, 80s, they would have been student activists. And now they're very much sort of establishment. Uh, but there are limits to how far uh, they can take things. <clears throat> so textbooks today are uh, quite different from what the textbooks used to be, but there are certainly still uh, certain limitations. And as for what I refer to as uh, post-Cold War scholarship, actually, in terms of literature, Hoffman saw many other writers, they've actually been talking about you know, this these aspects of the Korean War, the Korean War as like intimate violence, state violence, a war against society. Since 1970s, 1980s, um, it's just since the 2000s that you get sort of like historians writing monographs and so forth. But what I refer to as the official narrative, um, that's still orthodoxy. Still very, pretty firmly in place. <clears throat> I mean, oh, 
that uh, that statue. That's 1994, I think. Yes. It depends on the professor. <laughs> we have an online question from David Lucas. I think he's allowed. Yep. Yeah. Um, Please. Copy that one. Yeah. In your slide featuring uh, Go and Jump, you include data from Park Beijing's work showing that 70% of 8,000 people in South Korea surveyed in 1946 supported socialism. Would you care to expand on the nature of that support and the type of socialism that was supported? For example, was socialism supported the type that we understand today? Or was the support prevalent once it entered the demographics of society or more, more widespread? Right. So um, I haven't looked at the actual like uh, poll that was done by the United States Army military government. I don't know how that poll was taken, like which regions. Um, how they picked the people whom they polled, etc. So I don't have that data. When I teach this in, in class, sometimes a student would ask, did the people back then even understand what socialism meant? Right? So usually I would respond by saying, do you know what socialism yeah. means? <laughs> And then, then, then they would say no. <laughs> then you say, would you consider the possibility that they knew better than you what socialism was? And what does socialism make, mean to them? Land reform? Some sort of participatory government? I mean, if you think about socialism, let's say in Milwaukee, United States in 1930s, what does socialism mean to people? It meant clean government, right? Where politicians or officials are not corrupt. It depends. 1945, socialism means land reform, removal of those people for, uh, who had, were collaborators from positions of power and some sort of part participatory politics. That seems like a pretty good definition of socialism to me. You talk about the brutality of the uh, Korean authorities against the left-wing communists. What was it like in the North? I can imagine whatever it was like in the South, it's 10 times worse in the North. I can't imagine anybody speaking up against Stalin or, hey, have we thought about democracy up here? You know, I, I, I can't, you probably couldn't even use that word democracy. I mean, you have any feel for because it seemed like in work it would be much much worse back in that time any organization that had the word democracy in it were leftists because uh, democracy meant substantive democracy things like land reform etc so right-wing organizations would have the word let's say freedom chayu so anti-communists would use the word freedom, chayu. If you see organizations that have the word democracy in it, it's leftist. You have no, no comparison in terms of like the number of people being killed. You don't, you don't have that number of people being killed in the North. There's land reform. It's for the most part, not that violent. And the landlords are allowed to go to the South, come to the South. So landlords, policemen, they come South. When you think about, for example, like there's a number of um, myths, just assumptions that are quite strong. So for example, when the war breaks out, the saying is horror, everybody tries to leave Seoul. It's not true. The CIA estimated just a little bit over 10% left Seoul. There are other estimates that are higher, like 20%.
maybe even higher than 20%. However, they would also point out that of the people who are trying to leave Torah, the vast majority are those who have come from the north because they have fled the north and then now the Korean People's Army are coming and they feel that they will be targeted because they have fled. They're enemies of the state, etc. But the vast majority of people in Seoul stay. And then those who stay, stayed. Um, they would have a hard time when the South Korean army comes back in. You have to explain why you did not leave. Another thing about anti-communism is some people who are most, who become most anti-communist were those who have been leftists or um, whose families were leftists. Then you have to prove that you are not communist. And therefore, you have to be more anti-communist than everybody else. So if you have family members who are really anti-communist, it's not, unless they're, from, unless they're Christians from Northwest Korea, right? um, Taiwan province, Hongye province, if they're Protestant Christians from that area, they have their reasons to be anti-communist. But otherwise, there might be more complex reasons. I haven't done enough uh, research. So it's just, I would have to say speculation. I mean, cons different conservatives have different reasons for opposing trusteeship. I think, you know, Sung Man Rhee was smarter than Kim Koo. <laughs> Kim Koo was leading the Korean provisional government. The Korean provisional, a provisional government is different from a government in exile. Right? Its legitimacy is based on uh, being willing and able to resist Japanese colonial rule. Its reason for being, its legitimacy comes from, from the fact that these Koreans are willing to fight. The fact that they fight give them the right to form a provisional government, but they're not elected. And therefore their primary task is well to fight against the Japanese empire. And then after, after Korea is liberated to carry out the first three elections. So if the provisional government carries out the first three elections, then that government is created by Koreans, not by Americans, etc. Trusteeship removes the role of that role for the Korean provisional government. And that's why Kim Gu is opposed. It's a little bit different from what Sung Man Rhee is thinking about. By the time you get to 1948, Kim Gu's thinking has changed. I think he realized, and this is speculation, it says, shit. This UN elections in, the, in 1948 in the South is going to create two Koreas. It's going to make the division permanent. Kim Gu is an anti-communist, but he's willing to go to Pyongyang to try to find a different, different way. So obviously, the, I mean, if you want to go into the historiography a little bit more, <clears throat> 1970s and 1980s, Progressive scholars, they're not a huge fan of Kim Gu. But Kim Gu was a political, was a historical figure. I'm just gonna be very blunt here. It's convenient. 
he's anti-communist, he's conservative. And in 1948, he tried to find a different solution and opposed the 1948 elections that created South Korea and created lead to two Koreas. So the progressives actually helped build up Kim Gu and the Korean provisional government. Even though the Korean provisional government in 1945, by the time it turned, it's really not that significant. I think for some progressive historians, they kind of regret building up Kim Gu so much. Um, uh, quick question. Um, obviously, you have really involved in Korea, especially the development. Um, but I think recently, Korea has kind of said to you and things like also the Yongsan army base closed down recently, like three years ago. Was there kind of a moment when a South Korea particularly kind of you on the US shifted away from their our savior to, okay, we can handle ourselves now? There are different levels to that. Uh, sure. Sure. I think at the sort of the broadest sort of level, until about 1980 or so, of course, there's Gwangju, but aside from Gwangju, the United States was willing and able to pay the cost of being a hegemon. That included things like you know, letting South Korea get away with things, not open up its economy, allow South Korea to sell shirts and transistor radios and et cetera. From about 1980 onwards, and Trump is actually just a crystallization, you might say, of that trend. The United States is no longer willing and no longer able to pay the cost of being a hegemon. So if the United States is no longer willing and no longer able to pay the cost of being a hegemon, Henry, thanks very much. Very good. Make a few announcements. Uh, we can cut the morning. Oh,